Welcome to the Traders Clinic, your regular shot in the arm of trader insights, philosophy and knowledge brought to you by two professional money managers, Ali Kutz and Charlie Burton. In each episode, we cover your burning trading questions and also all things from the world of trading. We do indeed. And summer's arrived. It is. For us in the UK. Yeah. Thin white shirts. We're matching today. S- sleeves rolled up, you know. Yeah. That's, yeah. How, we, that's how we roll. Yeah, you operate. So it's warm. Right. Good. Well, speaking of summer, mm. um, we probably do this every summer that we do the show, but I think this is a, an appropriate question. And I've had this from traders, and I know you've had the same, which is basically, should I take the summer off? Mm. Yeah. Do you want to, I shall kick it off if you want. Start this one. Um, now, I, I'm going to examine the idea of why does this question come up and why do traders often ask me this question? And I think it's, it's more the slightly less experienced traders. But I think it's because a lot of the time traders think very in a very sort of linear, linear fashion. Because it could be that they are referring to the previous summer that was quiet, and they maybe looked up some statistics on market volume, and they see that markets are generally quieter during the summer period. And maybe they're looking for a reason to take some time off, or they've had or gone into a quiet period. And I think it's a risk in their thinking that because last year was quiet that this year is going to be the same. And it's the, it's the sort of Murphy's law thing or the subs law thing is that they take this summer off and suddenly something happens, the markets kick off and they miss a decent chunk of what would be their yearly profit. Mm. Yeah. I mean, one, a simple thing that a trader can do is look at the markets that they trade and just scroll back the charts, scroll back the charts to last summer and see, say if they trade S and P or whatever the market is or currency, whatever it is, and look and see how that market was moving last summer, and then could take it back another year and another year. And, and then they'll see that actually some years, some summers, of course, there's some choppy periods for several weeks, but you get that at any time in the year. You get consolidation periods in any market at any point of the year. So I think it's a, a bit of a, uh, a false flag really when people say, oh, don't trade August. Well, actually, have you actually checked that? Yes, volumes are quite often lower in August, but it doesn't mean, just because volumes are lower, doesn't mean to say that there's not movement because lower volume will still move the market around. And so you still do see August, which are moving perfectly fine. Um, I think it affects intraday traders a bit more because of that low volume. What you can end up having, ha- seeing is what I call sticky price action in intraday. But the markets, by the end of it, have still, you know, maybe done their ranges or whatever. So definitely something that needs needs checking. Plus, um, I think, like you said, coming back to the mentality of that, if a trader says, well, I'm going to take eight weeks off and come back to it, in theory, yeah, I mean, it's fine to do. But there's a couple of things. One, the market may not go quiet and then they'd miss out on the trade of the year sort of thing or or trading period which they would have actually capitalized on and even if it's moving around you know and it's quite and it is quieter well if you're not there then your your skills are diminishing well all the time you're not trading or not involved in the markets you you miss the little nuances and all of a sudden you've forgotten some of the things that you're that you're doing normally on a day-to-day basis the soft skills start to get softer and then you're not there as we said over a coffee this morning luck is when opportunity meets preparation so if you're not prepared because you've taken the summer off you've missed out on some of the things that are going on and then when the opportunity comes along you miss out and so and yet you might say to another trader oh you got lucky there you were around in the summer well you know not necessarily. I was around all for the other 300 days of the year. And I think, and it's also re- reinforcing the mindset that as a trader, you need to be following your process, your system, what it is you specifically do, regardless of outcome. So it shouldn't be, I don't think the summer should be a reason to try and excuse yourself from the market because of that exact reason. I want, I want to be operating the same way and having the same focus and diligence, whether I'm going through a quiet period, a losing period, or a winning period. It's, it's, it's also reaffirming that you should, be, you should be operating independently of what the market is giving you or not giving you. It's, a, it's the same if you take like a day trader who says, oh, I don't trade Mondays. They exclude themselves from the market. What? And you know something about Mondays. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, you know, there's quite plenty of Mondays that the market moves around. And you, you, we've talked about this before. You get, you know, intraday traders who say, well, I'll have, I'll have a losing trade and that's it. And yet I stopped trading for the day. And then you just missed on some great opportunities. It's the same philosophy as that, but apply to people having that, like you say, that very binary view of trading. Oh, well, it's the summer, so I'll take it off. Well, if you are going on holiday for the summer, fair enough. But otherwise, I think it's uh, it's slight, I don't want to say it's dangerous to to remove yourself from it, but you want to stay on top of your your skill sets, and you won't if you just you know put it all aside for eight weeks. Yeah, and I think. I also would question where that trader is in terms of their enjoyment of what they're doing, because, you know, we, we were away recently hiking in the States and, you know, the first, we were, two of the days were weekends, so the markets were closed, but either side of that, um, discussions and analysis and all the things we were doing and put it over at one point to check where, where the news had come in, because you, as a trader, you want to be relevant. You want to be in the market. You want to be taking the opportunities when they come along. And he may... The fact that you may want two months off, might you might want to ask yourself, why do you want two months off? Is it because you've had a, a losing period for the last couple of months or you're feeling less confident? And actually, it could be a signal that there's something else that needs to be looked at. Do you know, it's such a good point because we always say you need to be passionate about the market. Just reflecting on, you know, we've just done this uh, like mini trip out to the States, do some hiking. And like you said, when we were tra traveling across to the to the national park, we pulled over into the gas station just to check the markets because it had non-farm payroll day or whatever. And um, where's your passion if you say you want to take two months off, you know, just because you think that it might be quiet? Like you said, it could well be that the market's been already quiet and you've already, so I say given up, but you've already said, oh, well, you know, it's going to be quiet for the rest of the summer. But it's that same trader in October or November, who's talking to another trader who's had a great run because they got into a position or some positions and, you know, in the middle of the summer and there's some great runs. They're like, oh, you, you know, you smashed, you know, oh, you did so well. And then there, that's the same trader who's suffering regret, frustration yeah. in the autumn. Oh, yeah, I didn't do that. Yeah. You've just got to be there through all market environments. You have to be there. And um, don't get me wrong, it's healthy to, have a holiday, have a break. And for some traders, they need to have that disengagement from the market. For us, disengagement is more like the day-to-day -day stuff, not so much the market, mm. because that's just, you know. But I do, it coming back to what you say, it questions their commitment to the market and they have to ask themselves, maybe it's the back of a drawdown. Yeah. Something that's niggling away. Mm. Fascinating right. stuff. I've really answered that. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good, work, rounded way of answering a question that we get a lot of the time. Mm. So, and on to another question. So, quite specific, this one. So, I'll frame it up for everyone. So, the question revolves around the fact that this trader is experiencing a 6% drawdown on their funded account. They are close to their cutoff. And the question is, what should I do? Yeah, this was a question that came in. Um, I'll read it out specific uh, in its entirety here. So he said, I'm experiencing a 6% drawdown on my funded account, yep. uh, which is causing significant concern. I'm eager to find a solution to this situation before reaching the maximum allowable drawdown. Any advice or strategies to address this issue would be greatly appreciated. Of course they would. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, this was a couple of weeks ago, just to set the, uh, from when we're recording this, and this individual has subsequently come back to me after I sent a brief response uh, on that. But let's just take this as an overall concept because there must be lots of people yes. who are on funded accounts uh, who will be in this sort of situation where they're in a bit of a drawdown, getting close to that limit where that's it, they lose the funded account and they've got to start the whole process again um, because there's, well, there's a few things. So uh, we talked about um, it's causing significant concern, mm -hmm. eager to find a solution to the situation and looking for strategies to address the issue. Bang, good. Off you go. So, <laughs> where do we start? <laughs> well, let, let's start with the, the, the wider answer is nobody, regardless of prop firm or, or your own money, likes being in a drawdown, but it's an inevitable scenario. And it's not something that 
you know, I think a lot of traders think, well, once I'm five years down the line, then that's it. It's 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 bliss all the way. I'm never going to hit a drawdown. It's not the case. Drawdowns are just an inevitable part of trading, regardless of experience. The thing that happens, and I've had similar questions uh, with people in that same boat, is it's the cutoff. So this arbitrary cutoff that prop firms have, so whether it's 8% or 10%, that's going to create a, a, a much greater weight and a much greater anxiety on the drawdown they're at. Because at that point, if they're at 6%, the cutoff's 8 well, they're only 2% away from them having to go back and start all over again. Whereas the trader that's at 6% drawdown on their own account, um, they're not necessarily going to like it, but they don't have that absolute game over cutoff if they reach 8%. And the challenge is that there could be nothing wrong with the strategy that person is trading. Let's assume they're executing fairly accurately and they're following a, following a process. There could be nothing wrong with the fact that that trade, well, that strategy almost needs to go to an 8 or maybe even a 10% drawdown before it, it goes back the other way. So the problem there is, and I see this with a lot of traders that go straight into funded accounts, is they haven't actually, one, experienced a drawdown with their own money, so they haven't built up that resilience. And two, they haven't understood whether or not the strategy that they trade doesn't fit the parameters of the, the funded account system. So they, he could be doing everything right, have a perfectly good setup, perfectly good strategy, and now he's wanting to change it. He's looking to tweak it. He needs a new strategy because all he does is, all he, all he wants is to avoid this arbitrary cutoff which doesn't necessarily mean he's performing badly as a trader. It's a fascinating point you just made there about you could have a strategy or a method. Uh, we have to be yeah. careful. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Whatever your approach is, we, we call it a strategy. So yeah, yeah. whatever your approach is, it, your approach may not be conducive to a funded account program, but it may be perfectly con uh, suitable to having your own account with yeah. the program. No, I know that we, we advocate that. But we also have to be aware that there are youngsters out there who don't have the funds to have their own account. And so there's that's the sort of counter argument, but there's counters and counter arguments for, yes. for all of that. So um, you, absolutely, because if you, you could have a perfectly fine method or approach to the markets, but that's not that won't be profitable with something like that. Now, what some people uh, would do, if, you, if you've got, let's say, an 8% cutoff, is... You can't trade it in the way that, again, you would be able to trade in your own account. So, for example, um, let's take a, a typical uh, risk per trade scenario. So, let's say you risk 1% per um, Well, that's quite rich, you know, because if, you're, if your cutoff is, for argument's sake, 8%, then you could get to 8% fairly quickly um, as a drawdown. So what you need to do is if you're trading a funded account, I know a lot of people that trade funded accounts do do this, is you need to be much less. Yes. So you need to be risking 0.1 or 0.2 of 1% maybe. Um, so much, much lower. So, that, but then people say, well, yeah, but my funded account is, is only 10,000 or 50,000. So, so by the time you've gone so much lower to comp to offset the fact the the risk of a cut off getting cut off how much money are you actually making but then you need to go for the five hundred thousand pound account which then costs you more in the challenge and then it just brings you back well why don't you use that challenge money to put into your own yeah. account i wonder how many traders if they added up the amount of challenges they had could probably have five grand in yeah. a trading account you know, yeah. Side. Uh, you know but, yeah yeah but um so have we and, and what was interesting with that guy is he was asking for a, a solution. And have you could you recommend effectively any strategies to help me dig me out of this hole? So uh, again, that he was getting stressed, and I can understand that. So it comes back to emotion. Yeah. And the only way to counter that is to reduce the risk per trade. Um, but it's too late by the time he's got to six percent. Maybe I uh, you know he's still got to get out of that. The uh, the good news is that after that, um, well, only several days, because by the time I'd responded and he'd come back, he said he'd reduced the, uh, his drawdown to 4% now. So that's, that's where, where I left it off with him, but it's still a good lesson that if you're going to go down that approach, then you need to be risking way less because otherwise you're going to get to that level so quickly. Plus also, like you said look deeply at the strategy the method that you're using is it it may be profitable when you've done your let's say your back testing mm -hmm. with that strategy 
but it might not be profitable for something which has those sort of constraints with it. So it may be better for you to have a self-funded, your own brokerage account, and then it's fine. And that approach is fine, but it may not be suited to that. Exactly. Very wise words. And that does, yes, on that note, uh, what do we normally, how do we normally sign this off? Well, I'll, I'll start this time. He's Charlie Burton. And he's Ali Crook. Trade safely out there.